Bibles with me to the book of Matthew. We're going to Matthew chapter 24. Book of Matthew chapter 24. And, you know, as, as Seventh-day Adventists, this is a very well-known pa- book, right? Passage to us, right? When, we, when I tell you, when I ask you as a Seventh-day Adventist, what is, what is Matthew 24? What comes to your mind? Talk to me here. Signs of the times, prophecies, right? Let me turn to Matthew 24 too. Um, you know, it, we're very familiar with this chapter. And in this, pa- in this chapter, Jesus, right before he dies, he, he's warning his, the, it's a twofold, right? Twofold prophecy, not just about the destruction of Jerusalem, but also the signs that are to take place right before he comes. We have warnings, prophecies, um, wars, rumors of wars. That's where we have that famous, you know, saying, and we see it happening right before us right now. We, we hear, we talk of Ukraine, Russia. So the context of this chapter is the end of time, following me. Um, and at the end of the chapter, Jesus concludes with a parable that I believe has very potent relevance for God's people living in these last days. So turn with me to Matthew 24, and we're going to be looking at 45 verses 45 through 51, Matthew 25, verses 45 through 51. And it's a parable of two servants. 45, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food when? In due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all of his goods. Notice that this faithful and wise servant is giving food when, everybody, in due season. Now, why, why is it important, I ask? Why is it important to be giving food in due season or at the right time? Anyone? How many of you all had ice cream for breakfast this morning? Nobody, right? No, why? Not, what, what is it? Right, not healthy, not nutritious, not the right time, right? Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It should be probably our most nutritious meal of the day too, right? Oh, it's, it's a good health message, breakfast, right? Fruits, you know. <laughs> um, certain food has their appropriate time. And in like manner, spiritual food has um, its appropriate time to be given. Um, John chapter 6, Jesus tells us that he is the bread of life. You see, this faithful servant is responsible for giving food in due season, sharing a message, this present truth message, amen, that is relevant for the time that we're living in. And as we see throughout God's word, there's always been a people that have been proclaiming this present truth message. Enoch had it in his time. Abraham, Noah, what was Noah's message? Get in the ark, right? Get in the ark. This world is going to be destroyed. Isaiah, Daniel, John the Baptist, John the Revelator. What was John the Baptist's message? Repent, right? Jesus is coming. Repent. Um, You know, and so in like manner, we as God's people, his faithful and wise servant, have this present truth message that is relevant to the time that we are living in and is to be declared to the whole world. And what is that message? Revelation chapter 14. We see three angels bearing that message, right? Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, right? This is our message that is to be proclaimed to the world. We are living in perilous times and God's people are to be prepared and are to be actively involved in proclaiming this message to the world. However, this parable does not stop with the faithful and wise servant. And unfortunately, much of our message this morning is going to be concentrated on the latter, this evil servant. Let's start in the book, Matthew 24, verse 48. But if that evil servant says where? Says where, everybody? In his heart. My master is not coming. My master is what? Is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now this evil servant, what strikes me is in verse 48, this evil servant says where? In his heart that the master is delaying his coming. Now I don't know about you, but 
my heart doesn't have lips, right? My heart cannot speak. It's, it, 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 does, it can't verbalize anything. So I thought, what, is, what does this mean that this evil servant is saying in his heart? Turn with me to our scripture reading for this morning. It was Proverbs, the book of Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. When we get there, we can all say amen. Amen. The Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence. In other words, protect your heart. Guard your heart. Do everything possible. Be diligent in doing everything possible to to protect it, to keep it. Why? For out of it spring the issues of life. You know, the reason this evil servant says in his heart, it's not because this servant is outspoken. He's not proclaiming it publicly to the world saying, you know, the master delaying his coming. No, rather the Bible tells us that through his influence, through the issues that are coming out of his life, his actions exude this influence that communicates the message that Jesus is delaying his message. Are you following me here, right? Amen? You know, Jesus supports this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. He says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, the way that you and I live our lives, our words, our conversations, our actions, is communicating this message, this influence that essentially hampers the urgency of Christ's second coming. And notice that these are servants that we are talking about, right? These are, these are, you know, these are not people from the outside looking in. No, these are people within the house of God. We have the same master, the faithful and the wise servant. They're only distinguished by their character, right? The faithful and wise servant and the evil servant. And notice again that this evil servant is saying, it's not just saying in his heart that Jesus is not coming but rather that Christ is delaying his coming. Because let's be real, right? We all know that Christ is coming, amen? I, I'm firmly, firmly convicted of it. You know, whether you're a new Adventist or you've been an Adventist all of your life, you know, we see these signs. It's very clear all around us that yes, Christ is coming. There's no doubt about it. You know, wars, rumors of wars, Ukraine, Russia, pestilences. I mean, this is a pestilence, a plague that has not just affected our community, but on a global scale, when has this ever happened? You know, and Jesus in in the book of Matthew 24 likens these signs to what? Labor pangs, right? Like if anybody has ever been in labor, women or husbands have seen your, you know, wives in labor, you know that the baby is about to come when these labor pangs become more intense, when contractions become more intense in nature and they become closer together. We see that happening right before us. We don't see anybody on the pulpit right now preaching this message that Christ is not coming, that would be foolish. In fact, they would probably be disfellowshipped, right? They would, they would no longer be permitted to speak from the pulpit anymore. Um, you know, it's, it's in our names. We're, we're Adventists. We're waiting for the Advent. But instead, it is through their actions, through their conversations, their lifestyle, their influence that this message is being delivered. Their their influence is communicating, it's not that urgent. It's not that serious. Yes, yes, I understand he's coming. Yes, I know that for sure, but but maybe later. You know, let me let me do what I want today. This is this is my day. You know, we've all heard this word sphere of influence, right? I've heard it, you've heard it, we all have, and um We all have this sphere of influence that only you and I can impact. You can, only you can impact. If I were to step into that sphere of influence, I would not, my words would not have an impact the same way that yours would um, among your friends, among your families. And so the question is, is, is your lifestyle communicating that message that Jesus coming is being delayed? And remember that the church is made up out of, of people, and God has given his church this responsibility, this duty, this privilege to share with the world this message of a risen and soon coming savior who's currently interceding on our behalf, as we talked about in Sabbath school, interceding on our behalf this ju- during this judgment hour that we're living in. 
So how are we as members communicating this through our lifestyle? We, as God's good servants, have a duty to fulfill that our influence communicates this message of urgency that gives that food in due season, that presents this tr present truth message in both word and lifestyle. Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 17, verse 32. There's a biblical example that many of us have not thought about, me included. Luke chapter 17, and we're looking at verse 32. Amen. This, in fact, actually this chapter is also given in the context of Christ's second coming. And in Luke 17, verse 32, as Jesus is, you know, kind of warning about the coming of his kingdom, he also warns, remember Lot's wife. So let's do that today, shall we? Let's remember Lot's wife. What happened to Lot's wife? Who's Lot? Nephew of Abraham, right? Well, who, what happened to his wife? She became a pillar of salt. Why? She looked back, right? They were fleeing. They were told by God's angels themselves to flee the city. Um, and she, as she was leaving, looks back, and she becomes a pillar of salt. Now, I don't know about you, but growing up all my life, whenever I thought about Lot's wife, I thought, wow, what a worldly woman. Her lusts and her pleasures were of this world. She, her heart stayed in Sodom and Gomorrah. She was so influenced by them. This, this, what, what a... It's easy to judge, right? It's easy to judge and say, man, she, she did not have her heart, a true relationship with God, right? But hold up. Turn with me to Genesis, right? Let's look at the story, the context of the story in the book of Genesis chapter 19. And this is where we find the story of, um, or the account of Lot being visited by God's angels him themselves. And in Luke chapter 19, verse 15 and 16, these angels are urging Lot to get out of there. And in verse 15 and 16, when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he, what is the word, everybody? Lingered. While he lingered, the man took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. Oops. Wow. You know, when we, when we read this passage, we think, man, Lot's wife, right? But what does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us that it was actually Lot who lingered. And I want you to listen to what the pen of inspiration tells us. If we can go to the next slide, please. I love what she tells us in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 161, paragraph 2. Can we go to the next slide, please? Read it with me. It says, again, the so solemn command was given to hasten, for the fiery storm would be delayed but little longer. But one of the fugitives ventured to cast a look backward to the doomed city, and she became a monument of God's judgment. Listen to this. If Lot himself had manifested no hesitancy to obey the angel's warning, but had earnestly fled toward the mountains without one word of pleading or remonstrance, his wife would have also made her escape. The, what is the word, everyone? Influence. What is it? The influence of his example would have saved her from the sin that seals her doom, but his hesitancy and delay caused her to lightly regard the divine warning. While her body was upon the plain, her heart clung to Sodom, and she perished with it. Wow. Lot's wife could have been spared had Lot manifested this urgency for the warning and message that was given to him by God's angels. His influence caused his wife to lightly regard the divine warning and she perished along with Sodom Gomorrah. You know, my friends, my, Lot is probably going to be able to enjoy the blessings of heaven one day when Jesus comes, but his wife, she will not. And this was a very solemn message for me included. You know, we cannot underestimate the power of our influence. It's possible, you know, that somehow, some way, you and I can make it through the back door of the kingdom, right? It's, it's happened so many times before. 
Right, somebody on their deathbed, um, they've lived an entire life of sin, they've did whatever they want to, they've rebelled, but at their last breath, they've repented and will probably have the chance to walk through those pearly gates when Christ comes. But what about their life? What about the people they've influenced throughout the course of their life? What about us? I don't know, have any of you ever heard of Adoniram Judson? Adoniram Judson? He was the first Christian missionary to the country of Burma, now known as Myanmar. Um, he was a brilliant man, child of devout Christian parents, and he de demonstrated this brilliance at an early age. At the age of three, he was um, le he learned how to read the Bible, the entire Bible, read it through. At the age of four, he was found playing the preacher with his friends and teaching, you know, preaching to his, his friends, three and four year olds, about what he had learned through the Bible. At the age of 12, he began to um, preach in his own church and teach adults this time. Um, at the age of 17, he entered Providence College in Rhode Island. But it was during these years at Providence College that his intelligence got to his head. And he began to rely on the God of reason and his intelligence, and he renounced his faith altogether, renounced Christ, renounced Christianity, much to the dismay of his devout Christian parents. He began to explore their philosophies, beliefs, and he proclaimed himself a deist, um, depended on his reason and his own intelligence and logic. During his time at Providence College, he developed a close friendship with one of his roommates, a man by the name of Jacob Ames. And after a while, Jacob Ames too renounced his belief in God, his faith, his Christianity, and they were close friends, right? They, he became a deist as well. Well, they both eventually graduated. They went their separate ways. Um, Adoniram Judson, he took up an interest in the theatrical world, drama. So he's traveling all across the United States, attempting to learn from the different theatrical greats of that time. And one day, as he was traveling back home, he, be, he was super tired one day, and he thought, man, I need, to, I need to stop for the evening. I need to sleep. So he pulled over at a local inn um, on the side of the road, and he requested for a place to stay, but the innkeeper said, I'm so sorry. We have no more vacancy. We're completely full at this time. Adoniram Judson begged him, please, I'm so tired. I need to sleep tonight. Even if it's just out here in the lobby, I I'll pay anything. Just let me stay. And the innkeeper said, well, you know, we, we do have one room, but we haven't been able to keep anybody in that room. You see, there, the room right next to that room, there's a man who's very sick, and he's making a lot of ruckus and just not doing so well, and nobody has really been able to spend the night in that room because of, because of the noise and everything. But Adoniram, Adoniram, Adoniram Judson said, I'm so tired, I, I can't. Like, I, I don't even care at this point. Like, I'll just sleep there. It's, it's completely fine. So he gave him the room, but all through the night, he realized that the innkeeper was right. Next to him, next, just next door, he can hear thrashing and noise and banging, yelling, moaning, groaning. It, it, was, it was enough to despair, right? A, a madman, a sick man, who knows? Eventually, though, as the night progressed, the sound actually died off, and um, you know, he was able to get some shut-eye. The next morning, as he was checking out of the hotel, Adoniram Judson asked the innkeeper, hey, whatever happened to that man that you were saying next door? He actually became quiet throughout the, throughout the night. Is, is, he, is everything okay? Is he better? Well, the innkeeper said, unfortunately, no. He, he actually passed away in the wee hours of the morning. It's so sad, said the innkeeper, that a man of such caliber as he could die such an awful death. You see, he was a, a, an intelligent man a man from, that graduated with honors from Providence College in Rhode Island. I don't know if you might know him. He, he was a man by the name of Jacob Ames. When Adoniram Judson heard that, he walked out of the inn completely blinded, didn't know where he was going, hopped onto his horse, and as he recounts the story in his autobiography, he's, he's saying, he said that as the, as the hooves of the horse pounded into the ground, he could hear nothing else but two words, and that was death, hell, death, hell, death, hell. 
he pulled over that 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 day and he he gave his life to the the Lord. He bitterly repented because he realized that his influence upon this man resulted in his eternal destruction. Later that year, he went to went on to attend Andover Theological Seminary, and he afterwards, after one year there, he um, took upon himself the call along with his wife to go to Burma as the first Christian missionaries there, where he dedicated his entire life to the service of these people um, and to their salvation. You know, Adoniram Judson will likely be walking through those pearly gates, but his friend, Jacob Ames, may not. You know, this is a solemn and sobering thought to me. I don't know about you, and, and I am in no wise worthy to bear this message because I too have fallen into this trap where through my influence, through the influence we have communicated this message that hampers the urgency of Christ's second coming. But today, March 26, 2022, we can make this commitment to the Lord. We have lived this life as an evil servant for too long, and we want to make a change. You see, my friends, if we have tasted and seen that God is truly good, if we have experienced his salvation for ourselves, if he has loved us with this everlasting love that draws us to him, something that we could never deserve, and he's inviting us to this personal love relationship that, with him that will ultimately culminate in our reunion with him, the bridegroom coming for his bride. That's exciting news. Amen? We know that he's coming soon. How does that truth permeate our lives and our hearts and is communicated through the lifestyle? that we live, my friends, I am making today, this morning, a commitment to God to allow his love and his life to permeate my heart, to fill me so that out of the abundance of Jesus in my heart, we, I can exude an influence that invites others to a saving relationship with him. If this is your desire to make the same commitment to the Lord, I invite you to stand with me as we pray. Father God in heaven, Father, forgive us for where we have lost sight of what really matters in life. Father, forgive us if we have forgotten of this love or perhaps put it aside, not, not valued it as we should, this love that you have for us that draws us to you. Forgive us if somehow, some way through our lifestyle, we have communicated this message through our influence, communicated this message that you are delaying your coming. Father, we look forward to that day. Lord, the reunion of we, your church, your bride with a bridegroom. Father God in heaven, I pray that today as we make this commitment to you, that you will seal it with your spirit. That as we leave this place with this commitment, that people can, through our influence, be drawn to you. Be drawn to know you more realize the urgency of the times that we are living in. God, this week is going to be a week um, that is filled with trial, um, challenges, but as well as victories. And we know that it can only do so if you permeate and fill our hearts. So we invite you in this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.